thank you for that uh, introduction. Uh, well, I don't have a PowerPoint, but uh, everything I say is going to be about power. So we are going to talk about how power, the structure of power, uh, in, is changing uh, in the Indian Ocean and how India deals with it. But before I get into the talk, uh, I just want to thank the Indian Academy of Sciences uh, for giving me the privilege uh, of being with you uh, this evening. Uh, it's uh, not often, I think, after abandoning the field of science, uh, you make forays once in a while, but I think it's a great pleasure to come back and, and connect uh, with, the, with, with the community. Uh, I think it's also a moment where, uh, as India becomes a major power on the base of its new accelerated economic growth, uh, science and technology is going to be absolutely central to the way India's uh, role in the international system is going to be shaped. And, and it's really the kind of capabilities we build at home, especially uh, in the fields of science and technology, uh, that are going to be central to uh, defining uh, India's position uh, in, the, uh, in the international system. Uh, in some senses, I, mean, I think the Indian Ocean is back in fashion. I think it is a subject that was quite expansively discussed uh, by the, the strategic community. But it's uh, in the last two to three years, and suddenly there is a growing expansive interest in the in the politics of the Indian Ocean. I mean, just two days ago, or last week, the new book has been published. It's called the Monsoon. I mean, it's nothing to do with the science you do, but it's about the changing uh, politics of the Indian Ocean. Uh, it's by a well-known author called Robert Kaplan. Uh, it's already uh, making some uh, some waves. Uh, the excitement today uh, is really about the fact that the, for the first time in 40 years that there is talk about a possible power transition uh, in the Indian Ocean. That 40 years ago, more than 40 years ago, 1967, when Britain announced so-called East of Suez policy, that Britain, which had maintained security in this part of the world, uh, in the Indian Ocean, for almost 200 years from India, uh, that the US was going to withdraw by 1970 uh, from the Indian Ocean. So the debate then was if Britain was going to abandon as a declining power, as a power that is weakened after the Second World War, uh, who is going to maintain the security? So at that point of the time, it was pretty clear who was going to take over from Britain, and that was the that was the United States. So the, the transition from the US to the United States was fairly smooth. Uh, they were allies, uh, they were Anglo-Saxon powers, uh, they were Western powers. So it was a fairly easy shift from the, uh, from the British to the American role because Americans were not really present in the Indian Ocean. They were in the Pacific Ocean, but it's really uh, post-71 uh, that the, the Americans come into the Indian Ocean and take much of the responsibilities, which earlier were performed by the, the Royal Navy uh, by the British power uh, in, the, uh, in the Indian Ocean. The debate today uh, is, is about uh, if the Americans are on decline, if the American economy is on decline, if the American, if there's more pressure on the United States, particularly after the recession that has just finished, uh, is there a possibility of a change in who runs this part of the world, who runs the security uh, of, the, of the Indian Ocean? And I think the, it is in this context you know, that the, the rise of China, the rise of India, as new powers that is beginning to produce a whole new debate in terms of how in the context of the, the American decline, a relative decline if you want to, and the rise of China and the emergence of India, how that is going to shape the new politics of the, of the, of the Indian Ocean. Uh, the, the difference this time of course is for almost 500 years when you had, every time there was a power transition it moved from one Western power to another Western power. <coughs> there were the Portuguese were the first great maritime powers uh, after the, the Renaissance and the Reformation. And then you have uh, the Dutch, French came in for a short while, and the British took over, then the Americans took over. What you have different this time, for the first time, a local power, that is the Asian powers today, have the potential and possibility to play a role in shaping the security order in the Indian Ocean. This is fundamentally different from all the other power transitions we have seen. So therefore the rise of China and the emergence of India 
has created a structure, a new situation in which for the first time powers within the region, because we can quibble over China as part of the region or not, but the fact is that you have China and India today, as they grow, as they become major powers, what is going to be the shape uh, of, the, uh, of the Indian Ocean and how the security system uh, in this part of the world uh, is, is, is going to be uh, conducted. Uh, I don't want to labor the point too much of what is the strategic significance of the Indian Ocean. Uh, it's, it's pretty straightforward. I mean, it has got well, most of the world's resources, especially in the Gulf. And now with the discovery of Africa, you've got other resources, including uh, the energy resources. Uh, then you have, it's also the region where, uh, which is the source of violent extremism. Again, in Southwest Asia, in the Gulf. Uh, then you have, it's also the region where much of the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction is taking place. So therefore, and then there are what is now called uh, failing states or failed states, where there is no central authority in a particular place which creates space for people like Al-Qaeda or somebody else to use the absence of a state, whether it's in Somalia, where there's no state, or in Afghanistan, where it's state advocated, you have the prospects for uh, criminal groups or extremist groups to take hold and use that territorial space to conduct a range of global operations. So there, therefore, you have today uh, a, the importance of the Indian Ocean. A few deny it and everyone talks about it. Uh, what I thought I'd do is really to, to take up uh, uh, two aspects of, of the situation today. One is to, the first part, I'll try and explain, I mean, the, the changing structure of geopolitics uh, in the Indian Ocean. And in the second part, look at uh, what kind of a policy challenges does it pose for India? Uh, how should India react to uh, the new situation? And what are the policy constraints today for India to play a larger role uh, in this part of the world? Now, the central theme of, of geopolitics I mean, today is uh, the, the question of power transition we talked about. That is, the political scientists at least say, whenever there is a change in the distribution of power in the international system. When power varies from one to the other, some rising powers, some declining powers, some emerging powers, some fading powers, when power gets redistributed within the international system, that is the period of violent conflict. The old power doesn't let go. The new power uh, is trying to overreach. And it is at this point, how do you ensure the transition between one power to another power? And you should pardon the, the political science uh, audacity to talk in terms of structure and patterns, and but then uh, everyone wants to be scientists these days, so therefore there's some adaption. But I think not taking not taking too seriously or not pushed too far, but but in terms of understanding the structure of the international system and, and looking at the historic patterns, you can look at uh, the, the fact that whenever there is a change in the distribution of power in a given system then that's the period of conflict. The great uh, wars have all taken place. When Germany rose, the accommodation of Germany was so difficult. Or today, people compare, uh, when Japan rose in Asia, you had a problem. And today, when China is rising or India is emerging, then the structure becomes destabilized, and that's when the potential for, for conflict. But when we talk about, so what I thought I'd do is really look at the four, five, five aspects of this change, that, that the, the consequence of this change in the distribution of power, and, and look at uh, the, the, the five aspects. The first one is the nature of the economic transformation that is taking place in China and India. <coughs> you have Mr. Basu talking to you tomorrow, he's a real expert on economics. What I'm looking at is really in a purely macro macroeconomic sense, that the last great power which rose and fell was the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union grew on the basis of extracting surpluses from its own people. That you squeeze your peasantry, you squeeze your working class, you produce the, uh, the, 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 the surplus and that surplus goes into making the military power of the Soviet Union. But what China and India are doing is fundamentally different. That unlike the Soviet Union which dissociated itself, cut itself off from the international system, the capitalist system if you will, uh, chose to grow on the base of its own inner strength. But today, China and India are going to grow on the base of globalization. Whether it is getting their energy resources or some other resources, China and India are today growing as part of a globalizing effort. So this is going to be a very, very a different system. And that today you have the Chinese trade, uh, trade as percent of the Chinese GDP is close to 70%. 
and India is close to 35, it's going up uh, to probably to 37, 38 percent. And, and the scale of this change, when you go back to 1990 or 1980s, uh, the Chinese and Indians were not trading nations. I think when Rajiv Gandhi took over 25 years ago, 27 years ago, 1994, uh, India's trade was less than 20 billion dollars. Two-way trade, total trade. But today, India's trade is 450 billion dollars, half a trillion, just in 25 years. So you see the, the, the transformation that as, as the globalizing China and India uh, produce a very different outcomes than what the Soviet threat was to the, uh, to the, to the international system. The second aspect, I think, was as China and India rise, what you have is when you have these two large masses, gravity comes into play. That, that when you have China and India growing, accumulating this extraordinary economic strength, then you bend the spaces around you. So what you have is uh, both China and the Pacific and India and the Indian Ocean eventually will reorganize, reorder the spaces around them. And that's in the logic of having this economic strength. Economic strength means trading relationships, political relationships, security relationships. So when China and India turned inwards in the 50s, both of us turned inwards. But today as both of us look outwards today, your effect on the world and in the spaces around you is going to be dramatic and significant. And as a consequence of this bending of the spaces, through the gravitational pull and the reordering of the spaces around them, what you have is China and India are going to force a fundamental change in the nature of the relationships between the major powers in the, in the international system. And I think the principle, you know, the, the, the framework that, that is, I think, going to define the future of the relations in the Indian Ocean is the triangular relationship between China, India and the United States. And how this relationship will play itself out uh, in the coming years uh, is going to be uh, a, 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 the, the, the driver for uh, whatever happens uh, in, the, in the Indian Ocean. What exactly and how exactly this triangle will play out, we just at the beginning of this game, uh, we can see this in the, in the, in the, in the future. <laughs> a third aspect uh, of the change is because of the globalizing strategy that China and India have adopted, the seas, the oceans are going to matter to them as never before. When you're not trading nations, it didn't really matter, that seas didn't really matter. As, as China and India uh, were not great trading nations, were focused on their inward, uh, their, their orientation was inward looking, seas didn't matter. But today China's GDP is 70%, trade as personal GDP is 70%, for India is 35%. Trade is becoming a central element and much of the world's trade still goes by the seas. You can't fax your exports, uh, you have to send your, mostly you can't send them by air except a small amount. So therefore, if you're, if you're dependent on trade, oceans matter. There's a straightforward, unambiguous linkage between expanding trade, expanding interest in the, uh, in the, uh, in the, in the oceans and I think this is something uh, significant dramatic that, is, that, is, that has emerged uh, in, the, uh, in the international system with the rise of China and, and India. And it's also related to this of course is that when you have a, a, a power that was merely looking at its territories, its territorial defense, much of what we've done in defense in the last 60 years was really how do you protect your borders. But today if you have growing interests that are global, that is if your dependence on resources today means that if something happens in the Gulf tomorrow, if there is an incident or a straits of commerce in the Persian Gulf get blocked, a Lloyd's is going to raise insurance rates, your oil price is going to skyrocket. So we are the nature of the interdependence today between the Chinese economy and the Indian economy and the rest of the world is today so large that anything that happens in relation to the resources is going to make a dramatic effect on our economy. So unlike in the past, you cannot ignore what happens in your literal uh, in a way that uh, we could ignore in the past. We could be, we, it didn't have too much impact on us, nor we could make much impact on the, on the world uh, before. But today, uh, that the, the, as the oceans become the lifelines, as trade becomes your lifeline, as your dependence on the rest of the world grows, you have a completely different situation. Remember, we used to talk about self-reliance. 
that yes, we all grew up talking about self-reliance. <laughs> but today, India and China cannot grow on the basis of self-reliance. That the 8% growth rate of, in India or the 10% growth rate in China depends on getting resources from outside your territory. Whether it's oil from the Gulf in the Indian Ocean, or someday probably even food imports, that you need the other people's resources. This is not normally we don't talk about this, but the fact is that you're already beginning to look at possibly of growing some of the food grains in Africa. Now we have a big program for developing uh, agricultural cooperation with Africa. But the fact is that the growth of India and China is, if it is in a globalizing sense, in an interdependent sense, your dependence on the rest of the world and your need for resources, and that means stability in the rest of the world, become much more important. Therefore, your security then gets defined in a very, very different way. That historically, our emphasis, both China and India, was on securing as newly independent countries that were just coming out of the colonial period in the middle of the 20th century. The challenge was to defend your borders. In the Indian case, we had to defend new borders. The borders with Pakistan and China became a neighbor, so you were defending your borders. But today, you need to secure your interest far away from your shores. Therefore, the logic of building naval power automatically presents itself. And it's, it's, not, it's not surprising that as China and India began to globalize, began to depend more on trade, that both of them have begun to invest in a significant way in maritime power, in maritime strategy, and in building uh, the blue water navies, navies that can operate uh, far from the shores. The fifth set of issues in terms of what you can think about the the change that has come because of the new dependence on the oceans. Historically, both China and India, but essentially the security orientation was a landward orientation. Because as nationalists, of course, we must celebrate our maritime heroes. Uh, we have Raja Raja Chola, who in the 11th century went all the way to the Straits of Malacca, had done an expedition against what is now called, what is now Malaysia. The Chinese, of course, are reinventing the history of Changa, who came to the Indian Ocean nearly six centuries ago. Uh, so you have to sometimes invent history uh, or celebrate your past as a way of justifying what you're doing today. That's part of politics. That's part of the creating the scaffolding to say why India is a maritime power. So when Chinese say Changa was a great sailor, that he carried out seven great expeditions to the Indian Ocean, stopped at Cochin most of the time, stopped at Sri Lanka, stopped at went all the way to Africa. In fact, right now, a Chinese archaeological team is sitting in Kenya trying to prove, because no, it's, it's not, you know, proof is, I mean, most people are, agree with the fact that Changa did say here, yeah, but they're looking for archaeological remains of Changa's expedition in Kenya, trying to show this as a rising power showing that we were here before. We were not outside of this region. So what you have is this invention of history is interesting and useful, but the fact is, we were not maritime powers. We had some coastal thing, we had did some trade and all that. But our security was largely focused on, it's interestingly, both countries were focused on the northwest. But China, most of the invasions came from the northwest, the barbarians came from the northwest, from inner Asia. And that's why the Chinese built the Great Wall, to protect Beijing from the marauders from the northwest. Similarly, India's own security is largely been focused on the Northwest ever since Alexander the Great showed up at the Indus. That when Alexander the Great came, I mean, from the time of Alexander the Great, I mean, all great invasions, whichever empire that took, that took hold of Northern India was constantly defending against potential invaders from, from the Northwest. In some senses, that pattern has not changed. You're still struggling with Pakistan uh, on your Northwest. And most of today, your problems of, of Pakistan or Afghanistan still fit into the same pattern. So what you have is both the countries were locked into this defending against the Northwest. And that's the reason why, in fact, it's almost the same year, I think, when Baba showed up in Northwest India, uh, came into India, and Mr. Vasco da Gama also showed up here, somewhere further south of here. Uh, that, but, but our focus was on, the Mughal focus was all on the threats from the Northwest and not on maritime side. Uh, but so the, for, the, for, China, for China and India then, turning to the seas is a historic change in their orientation, in their mindset of moving away from the continental mindset to 
accepting, embracing a new maritime orientation. And this is a fundamental switch in terms of our strategic history, our strategic culture, that the oceans are going to matter and that our, our energy, our strategy, our security strategy, everything must now look a lot more at the oceans rather than merely looking at uh, our old continental threats that we face uh, from the north. So given this new situation as a new maritime imperative begins to envelop Delhi and Beijing, uh, what is the kind of strategy uh, we should adapt and what, what is the kind of problems that we face uh, in terms of our uh, long term strategy? I mean, if you have to turn to the seas, if you need a bigger role in the seas, if you need to play a larger role in the Indian Ocean, of course today, until five years ago, until two years ago, if you asked what is the threat from China, everybody said we get a 4,000 kilometer border with China. The threat on this border was the principal threat from China. But today you see China coming around from the south. The Hamad Nota port being built, has already been built uh, in Sri Lanka. They're building a port in Gwadar. Uh, they're looking for a port uh, in Burma. They're looking for a port in Bangladesh. But that's not surprising. I mean, actually, all great powers who came in the Indian Ocean actually did the same thing. What, was called, what the Portuguese did in this part of the world, in Goa, build a fort, build a, a, a network of ports which ran all the way on the east coast of Africa, in the Gulf, uh, in the east coast of Subcontinent, in Goa, in Cochin, in Malacca Strait. Through, so the, you, you had this network of ports, creating a network of ports is a central element and that's exactly what the Chinese are doing. Uh, that's what the British did, that's what the Portuguese did, that's what the Dutch did. So what the Chinese are doing is in the logical, structural scheme of things. So therefore you see the threat suddenly emerge from the south. China is not merely a continental threat, but today you face the Chinese challenge on the waters to the south. Therefore that poses a very different, fundamentally different kind of challenge for India and how does India deal with these challenges. Uh, let me, I, I identified about five sets of issues in terms of where India will have to change its thinking or come to reorganize its thinking or redefine its many of the very uh, dearly held positions that we've, we've had uh, in the past. Uh, for example, one transition we need to make is the, from the notion of strategic autonomy uh, to the notion of responsibility. Autonomy is very central. When you ask any foreign policy, so what is the principal objective in US foreign policy? They say it is strategic autonomy. What did strategic autonomy mean? Why is strategic autonomy so, so central for us? Whether you call it non alignment or they call it something else. Uh, autonomy is about preventing other powers from imposing their will on you. But if India is going to be one of the five economies of the world, is our task to prevent other powers from imposing the will, or is it our task to impose our will on other people? I put differently. The challenge is, is it about preventing other people, other great powers from enforcing the rules upon us? Or is it about India becoming one of the rule makers? That our traditional sense has been that look, either we are we're not going to access the rules, the rules made by the others. But today, if you're becoming, you are becoming, today we are the 10th largest economy on straight dollar terms. In PPP terms, we are the 5th largest economy. So, but as your weight grows in the international system, are we prepared mentally to transit from someone who's preventing the rest of the world from impinging on us to one where we contribute to making of the rules? That is, can you move from being a rule taker to a rule maker? Because somebody has to make rules in the international system. And, and also enforce those rules, uh, which need, of course, military power. So therefore, the question is, how does India move from being a, a mere rule taker or a rule breaker sometimes on the nuclear side to one of rule making? But that's a mental transition. And that's why if you see the debates on television and all this uh, old uh, diplomats talking away, you know, saying we're still suspicious of outsiders. But the question is, if your body is growing, but your mind is still stuck in the same old mindset. But, uh, so therefore, the struggle today, the debate on foreign policy, is largely about this. It has nothing to do with what the Americans are doing, what the Chinese are doing. It is about how we prepared mentally for a new role in the world, which is about being a rule maker 
rather than a rule taker. And that is a big transition uh, we, we, we need to do and we're we going to be have problems. And I think that's where uh, when the Americans say, look, is China a stakeholder in the international system? Or is India a responsible power in the international system? You saw what Mr. Obama did in the parliament on Monday night. Okay, we welcome you to become a member of the, a permanent member of the Security Council, but are you prepared to take positions on Iran? Are you prepared to take positions on Burma? I mean, it's not that we have to accept his logic on these two cases. But the important thing is, there's a broader question, I think it's a relevant response. But tomorrow when we sit in the Security Council, even as a non-permanent member, uh, whenever there is a vote on Iran, are we going to kind of slip out of the room, duck under the table, or are we going to say, look, we have a position. So therefore, as you become a major power, the question is, how does India prepare itself to take those positions on international issues as a, as a rising power, as a major power? That is one big transition uh, we, we, having, uh, we, we need to do, and I think that's going to be pretty difficult. It is going to be pretty con constantly contested by different groups uh, in Delhi in the foreign policy establishment. The second aspect, I mean, in terms of our policy challenge, uh, is really about power projection. <clears throat> when we talk about projection of power, what do we mean? When we say, can you deliver force across the seas to some other point? That is, can you actually, if tomorrow something happens, say for example in Sudan, I'm just giving off, off the head example. Tomorrow India has a $5 billion investment in Sudan and somebody nationalizes it or something happens in Sudan. Uh, are you going to sit back and say, look, oops, sorry, we're not going to do anything about it. Or you say, look, you use your levers to say, look, I must get some satisfaction or I must get, my case must be registered in some form. So therefore, the question is, are you capable of projecting power to distant areas away from your shores? Until now, as we said, the defense of India has largely been focused on territorial defense. That is, how do we defend our border with Pakistan? How do we defend our border with China? How do we protect your border from Bangladesh or from infiltration? From that today, if your interests are global, if your interests are spread all across the Indian Ocean, are we mentally prepared to use force beyond our borders? Now that means actually thinking in terms of expeditionary forces and not the territorial defense that India has been prepared for. That is, there's a, in terms of how you organize your forces, the logic of expeditionary forces, you should be able to deploy your forces to some other part, another country, uh, on a short notice. That means you need mobility, you need the logistics, you need the capacity to land forces in some other place and organizing your, you know, pursuing your interests afar from the shores. What's happened both in China and India is, is really that both these countries today, when they say they're building blue water capabilities and enable them, what is blue water navy? When you say green water, brown water, you're saying basically brown water navies or coastal navies that operate just next to the coast, protecting the coast. A blue water navy is the building ships and support systems that are capable of operating in distant places. As you build bigger ships, the ranges are bigger, they can carry more fuel, they can operate for the distances. But today, that we're moving from, from the traditional orientation, must as we did territorial defense on the land borders, our focus until now was how do you defend your territorial waters from others from coming in into your territorial waters. Chinese coming and shipping in your know, Bay of Bengal or uh, Arabian Sea or today ch challenge is not mainly to protect your own coastal waters, but how do you operate far beyond uh, your own your own borders? And I think that uh, is going to be a big challenge for 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 India. And then when you talk about force projection, it also means you have to have what is in, in strategic terms called forward presence. Uh, forward presence is a simpler word for it, it's having basis in other people's country, other, other people's territories. That is, you can't, ships can't go everywhere unless there are places where they can pick up fuel, pick up relief, pick up supplies in some other, in some other place. Uh, today when our ships, today Indian ships and the Chinese ships are operating in the Gulf of Aden in the last two years to protect the international shipping against piracy, 
we stop at Yemen or we stop at Aden or we stop at uh, Oman, Salela port or somewhere and say we pick up supplies from there. That means you need friends who will give you access to their ports. I uh, mean, we used to greatly object to the Americans having bases in the Indian Ocean. But if you're going to operate far from your shores, are you prepared to think in terms of having bases yourself? Because this is a very taboo subject. I mean, the our ministers and also oh, we, we are nice boys. We're not going to do, have bases in other people's territories. We always argued against other Americans having bases or Russians having bases. But if you're going to become a major power, if your navy has to operate far from your shores, are you prepared mentally to think in terms of bases and facilities in, in other people's countries? We're beginning to do some small things. Uh, the military has a nice jargon of its own. It's called domain awareness. That you begin to deploy a few radars in Maldives. Uh, you help, you know, you do some other things in, in Seychelles, you do some things in uh, Mauritius. These are all critical islands in the Indian Ocean. And that's what the Chinese too are doing. When they say they want a basin, they want to build a port in Gwadha or Hambantota. If you look at Sri Lanka, you know, look at the map. <coughs> Sri Lanka is exactly halfway between Malacca Straits, where the Chinese have to enter the Indian Ocean. From the east, you know, Singapore is right in the middle of the Malacca Straits. And the Gulf, where the oil resources are. So if you are in the middle, a transit point is where it is nice to have a transit point in between where you can come, do things, park yourself, or do various things in, in that place. So therefore, bases, facilities, support structures become very important uh, for blue water navies. And this is something both uh, India and China are looking uh, at and, and uh, beginning to look for uh, these kind of arrangements. Uh, in, in, other, in other countries. And here, I think when people say, we say bases, a lot of people get upset. But if you go back to the 1940s, when India was becoming independent, the greatest naval thinker of India at that time, K.M. Panika, who was a civil servant, uh, amateur historian, uh, and was ambassador to China, he was divan in many of the princely states. Uh, Panika wrote some of the most passionate things about India's maritime strategy. And he was writing in 1943-44. Why India should have India's future is in the seas. But to, so the, one of the things he said in 43 in his book on India and the Indian Ocean was to say how India must get bases in Singapore, Sri Lanka, Mauritius, uh, you know, uh, Djibouti, uh, all across the Indian Ocean so that you can support your base, uh, support, you can support your operations uh, far from your shores. He was talking about it in the 40s, but by the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, as we turned inward, the logic of thinking of force projection or of having bases was completely out of the question. But today, as, as we turn outward, as we look to the oceans, as we go outwards, and your interests become global, then the question of how do you support your blue water navy through having bases, etc., has become an, an important issue. A, a fourth set of issues is, uh, a third set of issues in terms of the challenges for us uh, is the question of until now, we said, look, nobody should have alliances with anybody. Alliances were bad. We are non-aligned. That means Americans should not come and have alliances with somebody in my neighborhood. But what about if somebody asks you for assistance? Okay, you say Americans are bad, but Chinese are bad. If Mauritius comes to you and says, look, I don't have a Coast Guard, will India help me build a Coast Guard? Do you provide security to the smaller state? In fact, a, since I lived in Singapore, I can give you the example. When Lee Kuan Yew came to India and said, in 1965, we are talking about, can you help us against Malaysia, where they're just separated from Malaysia, and said, can you help us give us military training? Of course, that time our policy was not to give military help to anybody. So Lee Kuan Yew said, uh, India is a big tree that doesn't give any shade. You can be very big, but you, you, don't, give, you don't offer support to smaller people. So the question today is, if smaller countries in the Indian Ocean want your help, are we prepared to give it? And I think we're beginning to do some of these things. Uh, because the Chinese are putting pressure on us. The Chinese went to Maldives two years ago and said, look, we're prepared to give you two ships. So we rushed to Maldives and said, look, you want anything, you call us. Uh, don't call the Chinese, we'll give you the ships. So we gave them two ships. So suddenly when you realize that if you don't provide security support for other people, somebody else is going to fill that vacuum and therefore the need to provide security assistance. So the, and the Navy did the same thing with Seychelles. Again, Seychelles, we feared the Chinese were going to come into Seychelles. 
Therefore, we went and gave them ships. All this was going out of the Navy's own inventory. But you recognize the danger of that if the Americans are going to get weaker, the Chinese are getting stronger, and the Chinese begin to acquire bases in the small islands. Because bases might be a big issue in big countries where nationalism is a big force. But in smaller places, this is not an issue. Seychelles has 85,000 people, is the population of Seychelles. And they're sitting across on the Indian Ocean, just across you on the other side of the, of the, uh, of the Indian Ocean, straddling across some of the most important sea lanes between Africa and the rest of the world. So the question is, are you prepared to do more for Seychelles or not? So when Shanghai Expo took place, Hu Jintao, the Chinese president, the world's number two economy today, uh, among the people who received in Shanghai were the president of Maldives and the president of Seychelles. You think you don't even notice president of Maldives or president of Seychelles if he walked past us. But for the Chinese, the importance of Seychelles and Maldives is because they're small, because they're sitting in critical locations. Maldives sits on, straddles the 8 degree channel in the Indian Ocean, where much of the shipping goes through east to west, west to east. Therefore, if you control Maldives, you can control much of the, this, the, the shipping that takes place uh, in the central part uh, of, the, of the Indian Ocean. So therefore, this whole question, does India become a security provider? Is it a tree that gives a shade to other people, or is it merely looking after itself? But then, this inv involves a fundamental change in our thinking about non land foreign presence, that we won't do alliances. That's okay, you won't do alliances with people bigger than you, but will you do alliances with people smaller than you? That can you give something to other people? We have the tradition of providing security. I mean, if you look at, we had a treaty system with Nepal, with Bhutan, with uh, Sikkim, and it was not fully independent, it was not fully integrated into India. So it's not that you don't have the tradition, but our politics or political discourse over the last 30 years said uh, non-alignment is everything. But today, if you're becoming a big country, other people are going to look for support to you. And therefore, can India become a security provider uh, in the Indian Ocean? That, in, that means it also requires giving arms, giving monetary help, military training, ships, as I said, in one of the case of Maldives and Mauritius. That can you, are you prepared, your system geared up to actually do these things? Do you have the capacity? to produce equipment that we can give to other people. Right now there's a big debate in Delhi on the shipyard. Mr. Anthony was speaking yesterday, the Defence Minister. Until now his emphasis was on every order must go to the PSUs. The PSUs are stuck with the throat with the orders from the Navy. They can't build ships for the next 20 years. So then finally now he's saying, look, no, we're going to give some of these orders to the private sector so that we can actually build. If you have the capacity to build ships, only then you can give ships to somebody else. So therefore that requires a fundamental reorganization and the creation of capacities within the country that can help you give the tools of military diplomacy that can change the dynamic uh, in, the, uh, in the Indian Ocean. That brings me to the, the fourth set of issues uh, in, in terms of where we need to change. Uh, the, the question of what is now called the commons, uh, the collective goods, who provides the collective goods? It's all that we all criticize the, the Americans. Who's looking after the security of the sea lanes today in the Persian Gulf, which is American Navy? Who's looking after the security of the sea lanes uh, in the Pacific Ocean, where the world's biggest trade flows are in the Western Pacific? It is American Navy. But tomorrow, if the American Navy gets weaker, the Chinese Navy gets stronger, the Indian Navy is close to the Are we prepared to provide collective goods? Until now, I talked about our particular national interest. But there are also collective interests, which is somebody has to protect the sea lanes. The same thing applies to other, other things like space. Outer space, cyberspace, of course, outer space is a physical domain. Uh, maritime space is a physical domain. Cyberspace is a man-made domain. But who regulates the actions in this part of the world? Who provides the policy? Because these spaces don't belong to any one particular country. But if they belong to no one, but someone needs to protect the basic operations in these domains. Who provides the collective goods? Normally you have the dominant power provides the rules in which this commerce can take place on the seas, in, you know, how satellites can operate securely in, in, in outer space and your, and your computers can work in the cyberspace. Now as India's capacities grow, is it prepared to contribute more to the maintenance of what we call the global commerce? So the fact that today we are in Aden, Aden may not 
protecting our own ships, we are protecting everybody's ships. Therefore, if you want to become a major power, we should be able to spend the resources to secure the global commons, for the collective good, for the public goods in the international system. And that, I think, is a, is a, new, way of, uh, a new way of thinking about our own role uh, in the region. And that involves a fundamental change in the approach we take. Until now, we said, look, uh, we're sitting in NIO. We said, look, what did we do in, in, in the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea came? 200 nautical miles, all the territory is mine, so therefore it's, it's all mine. And now, if the Chinese are doing the South China Sea by saying, look, nobody can come here and conduct some, some types of operations. Now, that is an extension of the principle of territoriality <coughs> to the seas. The same concept of how you defend your land uh, spaces, you can do the same thing. But if India becomes stronger, is it going to move from an emphasis on territoriality of territorial control of the oceans? Or will it say the seas must be open? Do we say, look, this whole Arabian Sea belongs to us? Or do we say, look, actually, I want to operate in South China Sea as well. Therefore, keeping the seas open is what the great powers do, maritime powers. Great trading nations need open sea lanes. So therefore, you can't have the territorial approach to thinking about the maritime spaces. So therefore, can we change from our previous emphasis on territoriality to one of saying, we're going to provide the public goods and we're going to keep the uh, sea lanes open. And the last set of issues uh, in relation to the challenge that we have, this notion of regional and non-regional. Well, the Chinese don't belong to the Indian Ocean, therefore they, they shouldn't come here. Or the Chinese saying, South China Sea belongs to the Chinese, therefore India cannot operate in South China Sea. This notion that you can separate these oceans, and oceans connect, oceans don't divide. If oceans connect, once, you know, there's every, the entire water body of the world is a single space, if you can look at it the wrong way. But the, at least in political science, what we have is that if Chinese power is going to rise, they are going to come into the Indian Ocean. If India's power is going to rise, India is going to go into the Pacific. So to say we can't, we will stop the Chinese. Or the Chinese to say India will not be allowed into the Pacific. It's not going to work. So our strategy must be not to say we will stop the Chinese from coming into the Indian Ocean. But how do I consolidate my own advantages in the Indian Ocean? How do I become a stronger player in the Indian Ocean rather than saying China has no right or Indian Ocean is India's ocean? Because nobody's going to buy that. Indian Ocean is India's ocean. So therefore, if you look at these five sets of challenges you know, on global commons, on regional versus extra regional, on providing security to the other states, on force projection, and on the, the nature of your blue water limits. And all these issues, we need fundamental change of thinking from our traditional positions of non-alignment, strategic alignment, to one where, as a, as a rising power, as an emerging power, we need to contribute to both uh, collective goods, as well as doing things to protect our own expanding security interests. So that brings us to the the concluding thought that when Panikkar wrote about India as a great maritime power 50 years ago, that didn't go anywhere because India's economy was not turning outwards. In fact, we shut ourselves down from the 50s, from the Avadi Congress of the Indian National Congress. But today as we open, when we have the resources, because if you grow at 8%, both China and India are not, it's very interesting how you can think about them, that China and India are going to be powerful before they're rich. That is, per capita incomes will be very low, but as long as you have large aggregate size and you spend a small portion of it, of the GDP on defense, you're going to produce capabilities which are going to be significant and dramatic. So therefore, if you're going to be rich before you're powerful, if you're going to be powerful before you're rich, then the kind of burdens that come to you as a, as a, as a power that must contribute to the maintenance of a security order, we're talking about a very, very different paradigm. But today, because of our growth, because of the size of the Indian economy as it grows, and because of the new maritime orientation, today the Panikkar's vision that India can be a great maritime power is today within our grasp. Uh, to, to, to realize that vision, that India can be a maritime power, would require, of course, as I said, some fundamental changes uh, in, our, in our thinking. Let me just conclude with the thought that I believe today we are celebrating the Portuguese arrival in, in Goa. Uh, that if you're not active, if you don't listen to a maritime imperative, uh, 
we might be celebrating the arrival of some other powers as well uh, into the region. The question is, are we ready to think differently? I think in a way that we are, uh, we do full justice to our own potential uh, in, the, in the Indian Ocean. I'll stop here and I'll take any questions. I'm sure you will all agree that we had a very thought-provoking talk and uh, Dr. Raja Mohan has agreed to take questions from the audience, comments. So uh, now it's open to all the questions and comments. First of all, I must congratulate you for giving this perspective on this situation involved in the Indian Ocean. It's a remarkable analysis that you presented <coughs> involving the international politics and the surrounding <coughs> Indian Ocean. Uh, I think the question of India and China that you have dealt is, is, is really very important and the, the kind of thought you have given requires a paradigm shift in terms of thinking um, on behalf of the Indian government uh, to tackle these issues in the right way. <coughs> the thing that uh, has been disturbing over so many, uh, past so many years is the uh, somewhat reluctance and diffidence on the part of the Indian government to tackle the Chinese in the, to the provocation that they have been making and, and therefore uh, if one wonders what is the strategy that one should adopt in tackling those provocation and and being a power which is commensurate, have a, have a uh, muscle power which is commensurate with the with the economic power that India is being projected, and uh, do you have any prescription as to how one would deal yeah. with the situation? I think it's a very good question. Sir. The the problem for us vis-à-vis -vis China is. The gap between the two of us is growing dramatically. In 1990, it's fully 13 years after the Chinese reforms, both of us were on par, $200 per capita income. That from there, what Chinese have done in the last 20 years, it's been dramatic. Now, we've been, we began to grow in this decade, but Chinese are growing at 10%, we're growing at 8%. The gap is going to keep, keep growing. That is, today our per capita income is 1200, the Chinese are 4000. Our GDP is 1.2 trillion, the Chinese are close to 5 trillion. Now, so the, you, you have then what the two of them can produce. I mean, here we were ahead of them on every indicator until the turn of the 1990s. Today our challenge is how do you firstly, you know, reduce this gap? Because partly you can only do if we maintain our own growth and create our own capabilities. But at this point, you're not in a position to do one-to-one. -one. That is, you can't match them into that. So you need to create an asymmetric strategy. One, that don't let the gap widen, so that you keep growing at 8%, hopefully he'll stumble at some point, you can begin to narrow the gap. But in the interim, in, in international relations, there are two ways in which you balance a stronger power. One is called the internal balance. That is, you mobilize your own resources to balance the outside power, or the, the new power that is rising. Or external balancing, which means you actually align with somebody else, because alignment is a bad word. But the question is, so the, you need to create some kind of a coalition, I think which is what we're trying to do. When we, when Mr. Obama comes to the Indian Parliament and says, look, don't look east, do more, uh, that you need to construct a coalition with the Japanese, with the Southeast Asians, with the whole range of people, so that you begin to create some basis to deal with the Chinese power. The second aspect is, don't pick a quarrel before you're ready for it. That is, don't make a fight till you're ready to win. So therefore, we need that space. What I'm stopping is to tell the Chinese, look, lie low, hide your brightness, cherish obscurity, uh, which Chinese are beginning to forget those lessons. Uh, we should keep that in mind that the important thing is strengthen ourselves, create the capabilities so that 10 years down the road, 20 years down the road, you're there, which means a focused development of what the Chinese call comprehensive national power. It's only when you have that, uh, you can you can deal with China. In the interim, you've got to manage it. You're not going to be able to confront them directly at this point. You need to do uh, a, a strategy that, that secures you the 22 two decades where you are ready to deal with the Chinese on, on an equal basis. Yeah, some, some years ago, almost two decades ago, when there was this question of the Diego Garcia Island being a naval base, 
for the United States. There is a lot of international debate, including those in India. What is the position now? And no, no, secondly, no, no. secondly, uh, while you talk about piracy from Somalia, there is the other Molokko streets, which is in Java and Sumatra, where also there is a piracy of a type going on. And India doesn't seem to be taking adequate interest about that matter also. You know, I think very good question. And I think on Digogasha, we don't talk about it anymore. Uh, in the 70s, we used to do, when we were in JNU, a lot of demonstrations against uh, American presence in Diego Gashi. Right now, right now you are, today we are working with the Americans. Uh, the, the nature of the cooperation between the two navies has significantly expanded. It's partly because the, if you, once you take a realistic position, that do you want the Americans to run the Gulf or the Chinese to run the Gulf? Do you want the American hand on the oil spigot in the Gulf? Or the Chinese hand on the Gulf. Now, previously, you know, the ideological argumentation is to, today you know Americans are a distant, you know, Chinese would argue it like this a foreign enemy, a near enemy. That is, if your neighbor gets control of the oil resources you need so badly, I would rather avoid that outcome and focus on the Americans here, they're not going to be here forever. I would rather work with them, the distant power rather than the near power. So, once we got out of the ideological mode of the 70s, today we don't talk about Indian Ocean zone of peace. We don't talk about Digo Gash. In any case, actually, it is British Indian Ocean Territory. It belongs to Mauritius. Someday, uh, we'll get it. I mean, that is down the road. <laughs> but we are not there yet. Uh, but on the Malacca states, no, we do quite a bit. Today, uh, there's regular exercises we do with the Malaysians, with the Singaporeans, with the Indonesians. And Singapore has been very helpful for us. So they give us the facilities, actually. They don't call it a base. We don't call it a base. Our ships can go there any time, pick up supplies. Malacca states is the key, the two ways. One, if you want to block the Chinese oil supplies, that is the place to do it. And if you want to operate, like Chinese want to operate in our backyard, you want to operate in the Chinese backyard, front yard, you have to go to the South China Sea. And if you only go there through the Malacca Straits. And I think we're now talking to the Vietnamese. Our problem is the lack of capabilities. Your Navy can go twice a year, show its flag. But ultimately, what are you prepared to put on the table? Are you prepared to go? If, if tomorrow Vietnam says, give me help because that Chinese are breathing down my neck. Do we have the capacity to give them things? So I think creating those capabilities to operate far from the shores, I think we're thinking about it, uh, we're beginning to recognize the uh, urgency and we're beginning to work on it. Uh, yes, Mr. Singhvi. Yeah. Can you get the mic to Mr. Singhvi? After this, Rama, you will. You yeah. mentioned the need of a kind of thinking shift, paradigm shift. I can't hear you. Closer to you. you had indicated the need of having a paradigm shift in thinking. You also mentioned the increase of uh, disparity between India and China with time. We know in science we were ahead, we are far behind now. Is it because we have too much of democracy and China has a very different kind of thing that our energies are spent elsewhere in 176,000 crores rather than in a difference? Or there is something else, or are we only limited by your democratic system that we can't go beyond that? No, uh, you know, scientists, I mean, you know the boundary conditions. The, the oh. democracy is a boundary condition, we cannot change. So there is no point uh, saying that we either we have fallen behind because of democracy, or actually, as Obama said in the parliament, India is growing because it's a democracy. That's nice rhetoric. But I think there's no point, uh, you know, getting into that because we have to, within the existing reality of our democratic, messy, crazy democratic system that we have, because we can't have anything else, we got to find a way of doing things. After all, we've shown in the last 15 years that we can grow, we can do things we've not done before. Uh, you've done a whole lot of things in science, in technology, in business, that we are capable of doing things within the existing system. I think what we needed is the more purposefulness, more focus on seeing what's happening around us and how we need to organize ourselves. My sense is the Chinese begin to turn the heat. What we can't do it ourselves, if the Chinese turn the heat, there will be so much pressure on us to do things, uh, some of the things we want to do. So, but this debate between democracy and development is a big debate. Uh, whether democracy, if you ask Deng Xiaoping, uh, Lee Kuan Yew, they say that democracy and development don't go together. But if India actually succeeds, if India actually succeeds, if India can sustain its 9% growth rate for the next 30 years, as Mr. Singh and Dr. Manmohan Singh wants to, then you prove that this is wrong. 
but then we still have to prove it. So, but then we have no choice but to, on the basis of the existing system, to do uh, to do what we need to build our capabilities. Uh, Rama. Yeah. Uh, so you spoke about uh, you just touched upon Africa. Can you say more about what we should be doing? What you think we should be doing in Africa vis-a-vis -vis what China has been doing? And the other China thing is when you Africa. talked about the port in Sri Lanka. You referred to it as a threat from the south. So, what exactly do you mean? Is it a physical security threat, and uh, what should we be worried about? No, on the second part, you know, what what I was saying was, the Chinese were not present in the Indian Ocean 20 years ago. First, their first ships came to Indian Ocean in '85. That was just a friendly port call to Bangladesh, Pakistan, and they went back. But today they are operating for the first time since Chandra came to the Indian Ocean six centuries ago. Today Chinese ships are operating in the Gulf of Aden. That's a historic moment. So it's not that Ambatota itself will, will kill us. Actually. Uh, today the Chinese are coming there in a big way. They are giving money, they are giving projects. Uh, if we cannot, when Sri Lankans came to us and said, will you build a, build a port at Ambatota? When Delhi slept and now the Chinese came in and built the port in two years. So, partly because we didn't even think about Chinese coming into the Indian Ocean. But there was some, they produced a strategic surprise that we have to deal with. Africa, Africa is going to be absolutely central for both China and India. Both are dependent on foreign resources. Most resources are in Africa. So, both of us, we already see in the last 10 years a dramatic expansion of Chinese and Indian trade in Africa. It's, it's, it's mind boggling. Chinese scale is much bigger. And Chinese are using massive aid packages to build infrastructure, to build ports, to exploit resources. It's like a gigantic effort that is going on, what we haven't seen in Africa from the so-called scramble for Africa in the 19th century. So the scale of the Chinese, it's not just Africa. Papua New Guinea, you go to any corner of the Indian Ocean today. Fiji, where we used to be Indian, you know, majority, minority, quite close, to the Chinese have become major player in Fiji. Papua New Guinea, we don't even care where it is. Five billion dollars, the biggest investment ever in the mines, uh, aluminum mines of uh, of Papua New Guinea. Seychelles, Mauritius, you, you know, here is an economy that's growing at 10%. Ambition, resources, is driving it like, you know, it's like a gigantic machine that is rolling out. We're doing things, but not on the same scale. Uh, our own trade has improved dramatically. We're doing a lot more projects, but the model has become very different. The Chinese case, it is the state enterprises backed by cheap money from the banks, you take your own labor, and two things are there. The Indian thing is more, more public, private sector driven. So you have Mr. Sunil Bharti Mittal buys Zane Telecom, or he picks up a, you know, Telecom, you know, Tata's are building cars in South Africa. So it is driven by the private sector, not by the public sector, where the public sector is more strategic in a Chinese sense. So our presence is there, it, it has to be more focused and, and, and brought into where you able to synergize strategy between your private sector and your government because state can, our state cannot do it but you need to produce a synergy between security strategy and the private sector involvement. Yeah. Uh, we are inching towards the end. I'll take two more questions. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's pretty clear that China is going to be our biggest adversary. It already is. So I, I have two questions and one you've partly answered regarding democracy and <coughs> democracy in China. Uh, my other question is, is our interaction with China in the future going to be necessarily confrontational or is there a role for cooperation? It, it has to be both. And you already see that. I mean, that today China is your largest trading partner on merchandise goods. Uh, the trade with China is now close to $60 billion because a lot, lot of it is iron ore exports from India. Uh, the trade is imbalanced, but the size of the interaction with China is, is, is dramatically growing. And then you have today your power sector. Today, if you ask the, anybody who is building in India power, a power project, they would rather get the Chinese uh, equipment because it's so much cheaper. Mr. Ambani, last week, uh, younger Ambani, signed a deal with the Chinese Shanghai Electric Power Company. Eight billion dollars worth of a deal. Of course, money is going to come from the Chinese. The Chinese have excess capacity, a lot of money. Chinese is saying, look, I'll give you $8 billion, go build your power plants. So on some areas, we're actually 
you might benefit, assuming the recruitment works and all that. I mean, that's a different story. <laughs> uh, but, but the fact is, you today, Chinese have the finance and the excess capacity to produce goods. Therefore, you bring. So there are areas where you actually have to cooperate with them. But on the other hand, the Chinese are trying to balance you in the subcontinent. They've given nuclear weapons to Pakistan, they've given missiles to Pakistan, and what there would be no terrorism in India today if Pakistan did not get nuclear weapons. Because that neutralized your conventional superiority. So therefore China has done us a lot of harm. But but then we need to think of a strategy that is you have to find their weak spots and deal with it. And therefore what you need to do is to begin to build up relationships with Japan, with Korea, with a range of other countries. So you need to play the balancing game while both cooperation and confrontation will go on simultaneously. But the question is as long as we are weaker than them, the need is to manage it carefully while creating the domestic capabilities to eventually be able to deal with, deal with China as a leader. Uh, yeah. India spends less than 3% of its GDP on health and maximum on defense. So I want to know how uh, spending on other countries and that too for the defense is going to affect sectors like education and health in India. No, it's a good question. Guns versus butter, right? I mean, that is the basic question. I think, you know, India is not poor because it's spending more on defense. In fact, except for two years, we've never crossed 3, 3.5% as GDP, as percentage of, uh, uh, defense as percentage of GDP. So the problem that you, you, your social sector is suffering not because we're spending too much on defense. Uh, we're poor because of our poverty of our, our strategy towards defeating poverty, not because you're spending too much on, on guns. And in fact, those who grow faster, actually have money to spend on both guns and butter. The highest spenders on, on, on guns are also the ones who grow fastest. Today, Southeast Asia, which has last 30 years has grown at 7%, 8%, they're the biggest spenders. And then our, our cousins in the Gulf, who, because they have so much riches. So I think it is not, the guns versus butter is an easy contradiction to pose. But I think today, why is it that the government can throw 10,000 crores at Enriga, something else? Because Today money is not the problem. Today your problem is in governance, your strategy, a whole range of issues. And today we're spending, today your defense ministry is returning money every year. So on defense the problem is not that we're spending too much. You don't have the capacity to even spend. That is the, the log jam that in Delhi is that it can't even spend the money on, on guns when the parliament has approved the money and they're returning every year 20 crores, 20,000 crores. So that is the issue. So I would say what is important, we need to spend more on social sector but that's not because we, it's because we're doing too much on defense. You need to do both. Do it intelligently. That is the issue, not one versus the other. So we now have the final question from Dr. Chadda. Uh, I just want to know, does military... Can you put it on? It's not working. Does military power come more logically from economic growth or from industrial growth? Do you think for maritime power we need to have the capability to build submarines and the other? No, I, I think the economic power, industrial power are the same thing. That, that without economic power, there's nothing. You can be rich and militarily weak in a, in a specific historic condition like Japan is. But without economic power, there can be no military power because military power flows out of having the resources to spend on defense. But of course, we can be like Pakistan and keep spending on defense, but that's not going to work. So, India is today important. Today, people are saying India is rising power, not because we have nuclear weapons. Pakistan also has nuclear weapons. It is because we are growing at 8%. Yeah. That's why we are. Yeah. We have the capacity to become a power. and that. So, the central thing is economics. But once you, today you are on a growth path, uh, your options have increased. Your capacity to spend on defense has increased. Your capacity to negotiate with others has increased. So, if it's opened up all options, but if you're not a growing economy, Nobody's going to pay us attention. Then you be, be like Pakistan. But in terms of submarines, yes, absolutely. There's a great quote from Mao Zedong. When Chinese started up the submarines, nuclear submarines, he said, look, I don't care if it takes a hundred years, but I want you to build a submarine in this country. So what he was emphasizing was, this is something you're not going to get from many people. Therefore, you need to spend, develop the technological skills, the scientific skills to be able to build a submarine. And I think we've squandered many times, you buy a submarine, you, you, know, you know how difficult it is. The assembling people, the welders, everyone is a very special skill. Then we stopped for 20 years, all those people have disappeared. So the challenge of projects like submarine is where you need that focused state effort. 
uh, while we got trapped into this whole uh, defense uh, acquisition, which is in a terrible mess, mm -hmm. uh, we've lost a lot of opportunity. But something like submarine uh, is, is, is absolutely represents all the cutting edge technologies. And how you do that uh, requires very focused thinking. Uh, I'm sorry, I have to be the villain here. I have to stop this very interesting uh, and thought-provoking discussion uh, with the speaker. Uh, I wish we had another hour for that. Uh, but uh, I'm sure all of you will agree that this talk has touched uh, some part in us, makes us think the role of India, where we stand and so on. It's a very uh, stimulating talk. So please join me in thanking uh,